Let's open our Bibles to the most repeated prophecy in its fulfillment in the whole Bible. What prophecy is fulfilled twice a second, constantly, 24-7? Have you ever thought about it? A prophecy in the Bible, something God prophesied would happen, and it happens twice every second around the world constantly. It's in Hebrews 9, and it's in verses 26, 27, and 28. And I'm going to focus on verse 27. And that's going to be where we begin looking at biblical prophecy and how God has laid out the plan for the future. And we're looking at what is next. And this is the next event for the majority of people on this planet in their life. The next event for them. And it's something for us to think about. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Have you ever thought about that? God declared that there is a future event for every human being on this planet. If they have never come beneath the protection, beneath the shadow, beneath the covering, cleansing, marvelous work of the cross of Jesus Christ, then they are going to, at the instant of their death, begin the endless payment that is due for their sin. Now think about that. We're talking about this morning the grave. That's the next event prophetically. For the majority of the people on this planet, the first time they're going to intersect with God in a very powerful and unforgettable and unescapable way is at the instant of their death. Let's study a little bit death this morning. Because this morning we're going to look at the most frequently fulfilled prophecy of all. The one event that God promised would happen, warned everyone to prepare for, and yet this prophetic event takes almost everyone off guard and by surprise. I must say, even among believers, there's a little lack of preparation. Do you know what would be wonderful? If every single born-again believer would sit down and write out their testimony and write out what they want to be remembered for and their favorite hymns and scriptures, you will save your wife, your husband, and your children and your friends a lot of grief. Because I regularly meet with people and I say to the departed, or about the departed one, I say, what was their favorite verse? I don't, I'm not sure. What was their favorite hymn? I don't know. Could you tell me their testimony? I'm not sure. Now that's a tragedy because a a funeral should be a time of the greatest declaration of the greatest events in someone's life. And what's the single greatest event in your life? Yeah, your salvation. Or if, if, if you've been saved, it should be, okay? And so let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So even for believers, we're taken off guard because most people don't want to talk about it. I've met people that are on their last leg. They've had multiple strokes. They can barely breathe. And I say, uh, have you thought about your funeral? I'm not dying. I am. I'm unashamed. I've already written it out. I mean, I am, I am ready. I want to make sure that as much as possible gets in there. Don't deny the reality and the inescapable nature of death. Apart from the momentary in the clouds return of Jesus Christ in the moment of the twinkle of the eye when we will be changed, other than those who get to go in the group exit, the majority of us will go one by one. We will be raptured out of this world one by one. And we should think about that and prepare. So if you haven't written it out, why don't you think about it? Your testimony is powerful. The more you write it out, the clearer it gets and the easier you can share it. Of course, what takes most people off guard and by surprise is death. But the scriptures say in verse 27 that it's the judgment of God upon all who die in their sins that is what we should meditate on. It's a very sobering thought. Every second, two people die somewhere on this planet. Actually, it's 1.8, but I don't know how 0.8 of a person can die. So two people, I'll say, okay? Two people die every second, okay? 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 10 people just died. 10 dads, 10 moms, 10 kids died. That, I mean, that's, that goes on 24-7, 365. That's just death. Have you ever thought about what happens just one moment after death? Well, let's turn back to the Gospel by John now, chapter 8. We're going to go to a lot of verses before we park in one passage and stay there the whole time. 
But John chapter 8, so that we would know and be ready, Jesus instructs us in his word. And John 8, 24 tells us the first truth of Jesus' instruction to us. And this truth in the 24th verse of the 8th chapter of the Gospel by John is that Jesus warns that the very worst thing that could happen to anyone is for them to die, listen, in their sins. We're all sinners. I just finished doing discovery class this morning. My lesson is uh, what we believe, and part of what we believe is we're an evangelical church, which means that we believe people have to come to a moment of conversion. Non-evangelical churches believe that you're saved by a process. It starts uh, when your parents get you baptized as an infant. It continues when you are confirmed. It continues when you take part in communion. And finally, uh, you know, if your good outweighs your bad, you make it. To heaven. That's a non-evangelical church, which are about half of all the churches in America and in this city. Uh, the other half are evangelical, which means you must believe the gospel. You must be born again. When you're born again, and when I was born again, my sins, all of them, not just the, the first six years, which were more than enough to damn me to eternal hell, one of them would have been, but all my sins the day that I was saved and all my sins until my last breath, brainwave, and heartbeat on this planet, all of them were placed on Christ. See, a lot of people don't completely understand the doctrine of salvation. They think that everything's taken care of before you're saved and you've got to take care of the rest. And if you don't do pretty well, then you're not sure you're saved. And you might do one too many and you might get unsaved. And that's fallacious and unbiblical and wrong. Jesus Christ, look at verse 24. He says, therefore I say unto you that you... This is a bunch of people that were resisting, rejecting, hardening their hearts. They knew the truth. They closed their eyes to it. They, they had the truth incarnate in front of them. They didn't want the truth. They didn't want Christ. They didn't want the light. So they were, they were angry at him and hardened. And he says, I say to you that you will die in your sins. Hmm. For if you do not believe that I am he, he says it again, you will die in your sins. That brings us to the great theological point that the only limit on Christ's atonement is what? Unbelief. He says it right here. Look, look what he says at the end. For if you do not believe that I am he, there's the, the agent of change, you'll die in your sins. So the first thing Jesus says is, the very worst thing could happen to anyone is for them to die in their sins. Now, what happens at the instant of death? Look at 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 and 8. This is one of those verses you should know. The first one we looked at, you should know. It's a point unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. This one is another very, very important verse, and it says this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. So we're always confident, knowing that while we were at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. Slip down to verse 8. We are confident, yes, and well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You, you see what Paul does? He makes something very clear. While you're at home in your body, while you're alive on planet Earth, you're not in heaven with the Lord. Then he says it the other way. When you're absent from this body, you are consciously present with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, present in the Lord, or present in the body, absent from the Lord. What it says is that there is never a unconscious soul sleep time. Either you're consciously alive on planet earth or when your body dies. And by the way, that's all that dies. The body. You are not your body. Your body is like your car. And if you think you're your car, then you know, you need to go somewhere this morning and have them help you. Uh, because you are not your car. You just ride around in your car. You are not your house. You live in your house, but you are not the, the house is not you. The body is not you. We get all mixed up. We live so much of our life for the container we live in. And we're trying to polish the container and paint the container and slim down the container and make the container look younger and patch the cracks in the container. When actually, it's almost like a bird that is coming out of its shell. How would you like if someone kept, you know, in the spring, which is soon upon us, the little birds are going to be hatching out of those egg shells, you know, and little nests all over. We have them in our house and you, they're really loud when they're first, you know, just beep, 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 beep. We can hear them. I had one right over my office. 
there was a hole in the the little uh, vent, and there was a bird nest this big around, so many generations. And I would be sitting, working at my computer, and right over my head, I mean, sometimes I'd go like this, because you don't have much protection up here. I thought it was going to be plop, you know, uh, those birds. Uh, They were so loud. I thought, boy, my hearing is getting better or something. And it was springtime. Remember, we moved in March 29th, and in March, I mean, February 29th, and in March, those those birds were laying their eggs, I guess, in April. They were hatching, or May, I don't know when they hatched. They were really peeping. But what if someone would have climbed up there and kept patching the eggshell, taping it back up? It, it was ruining what was going to happen. That was the birth of the bird. It, it's coming out. That's what I think about when Christians deny their mortality and when Christians deny that they're getting old and dying. Here the Lord is cracking our shells of our body and our circulation doesn't work and our, uh, everything aches and we can hardly walk and we can hardly eat and we can hardly breathe. And, and we're trying to patch all that up instead of saying, soon I'm going to be released from this shell and be finally what God created me to forever be. Actually, death is the beginning of the greatest time of your life, the death of your body. Because this body, flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. God says, no bodies allowed. Those sinful, fallen, uh, uh, flesh, just stained bodies, they cannot come here. They have to be shed. And so to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. That's the second truth that Jesus gives us. Now, here's the last one. Turn to Luke chapter 12. This isn't where we're going to park, but it's almost where we're going to park, okay? So Luke 12. And I want to share with you from Luke 12 the the final thing that Jesus says. Because this morning, the final truth that Jesus speaks of most frequently, over 40 times just in the book, of Matthew. And on and on through the Gospels, Jesus constantly is speaking about this judgment to follow life on this planet for those who die, whose shells crack, and whose spirits are released from this container we live in, still stained by sin. For everybody that leaves earth, still stained and wearing. The Old Testament says that our sins are on us like a garment. Not on our bodies, on our spirits. Those who leave the planet with any sins attached. Jesus warned about that. And let's, let's look at this. Because... Jesus lets us know in chapter 12, and I'm going to start in verse 16, he lets us know that the dead awaken from the momentary rest of death in a very real, a very painful, and a very different place. Okay? Instantly. I mean, death, uh, for some, like someone that's being crushed alive or being tortured or has bone cancer, death releases them momentarily from that horror of whatever, you know, uh, torture or cancer or something like that or asphyxiation or a burning building or whatever. Just for an instant, it releases them from that. But if they don't know Christ, they begin a very horrible, conscious, inescapable judgment for their sins. And that's what Jesus is getting into He says that the first thing that a lost person experiences is the inescapable reality that they now have to live with the results of their choices. They've chosen to remain in their sin. They've chosen to resist, to deny, to say no, to neglect Jesus Christ. So every second, over and over again, the prophecy of God's word happens. People face death alone. People face death in their sins. People face death in horror, in pain, and the endless punishment their sins deserve. So what does Jesus say? He says that's what so many experience one moment after death. Luke 12, 16 to 20. Now this is 
Just one little example of what Jesus said, and I'd like you to think about it with me, starting in Luke 12 and verse 16 and on down through verse 20. I'll start in verse 16. You follow along. Then, now listen to this, he spoke a parable. Now that's good to know. This is a parable. Not a literal event. It's a parable. It's, it's a story that has a deep meaning. But it's not a literal, literal historic occurrence. It's a parable. Okay, And Jesus identifies his parables uh, over and over again. And he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? And he said, I'll do this, I'll pull down my barns, I'll build greater uh, implied barns, and there I will store all my crops and my goods, and I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, verse 20, fool. Now here's the whole lesson of the parable. See, now God, now it's not, it's gone from just being a beautiful story to the punchline. Here's the punchline. God said to him, fool. Now look, this is Jesus' reoccurring warning. This night your soul will be required of you. Why? Because he's died. He died. One of those two every second that are dying around the planet. The instant you die, there's a prophecy that God fulfills. God fulfills his word. If he says something's going to happen, it happens. And if someone dies in their sin, this is what God says, your soul will be required of you. In other words, you have to pay for your sin. And it will take forever. It's a very sobering thought. Don't play around with sin. Sin is horrible. And if you die clothed in your sin, God says, you've got to pay for it. Your soul will be required of you. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray in this sobering time, as we celebrate the communion of those who have partaken of you, O Christ, we who know that our sins are gone and shall never be remembered because you, O God, in tender mercy have forgiven them. As we celebrate that blessed truth, I know that in a group of this size that there is certainly at least one and perhaps many more who have never personally experienced salvation, the forgiveness of sins, the new birth, the regeneration that you have so freely offered. And I pray that as we study your word, that your spirit will use your word to penetrate our hearts and to prepare us for one moment after our death of our body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to turn four chapters over to Luke 16, and that's where we're going to stay this morning. As you're turning there, one of the most vivid recollections of my youth took place in the middle of one dark and rainy night, July of 1996. In the pitch black of that night, I awoke with a start by the seeming pain of being struck in the face. I was just 10 years old, and something had hit me, and whatever it was was now sliding down my face and my neck. As I opened my eyes, it was absolutely dark. It was so dark I could feel it. I was cold. I was tightly packed in. I could hardly move. And above all that, there was a brief flash of fear, the fright of the unknown. My mind started spinning. I said, where am I? What hit me? What's happening? It's like when you wake up and you don't know what happened and and your mind is just flying. I thought, why is it so dark? What was rolling down my face and neck? So I instantly sat up, like sometimes we do, trying to wake up if we don't like the dream. And I sat up, and as I went like this, my head hit the side of a cold canvas tent. And I instantly, as I sat there, and I could hear the low rumble of my father's snoring, 
I remembered where I was. I was in a little tiny World War II Army-issued pup tent. I was far from anything with my dad in the northern parts just below Hudson's Bay on one of his expeditions in Canada, and it was the middle of the night. So I settled back down in the tent. As I laid back processing that, I was struck again. A larger cold drop of water than the previous one hit my face and it had fallen from directly above my head. And so as I laid there with that cold drop running down, dipping under my chin and going down into my shirt, which was starting to get wet, I realized what had happened. I was receiving the inescapable result of a wrong decision I had made. Now, I had traveled with my dad. He was a great expedition leader, still is. Although he can't travel anymore, he can tell the stories. And he had warned me as on a stormy afternoon, we had dug the trench around, or the little, little trench around our tent and put the tent up in a spot where the rain would run off and the water would run in the little trench. He said, Johnny, now remember this. He said, once we're inside the tent, our breath will make a vapor lock and we will be dry and warm all night long. Don't touch the tent. I was 10 years old and very smart. (laughs) And so I laid there waiting for the pattern breathing of my father to begin. It was so hard for him to hide he was sleeping because he, you know, just really snored. So I waited for it to get really methodical and systematic and it was pitch black and it was raining. The rain was just beating against the tent. And so I pulled my arm out of my sleeping bag, and it was totally black. I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face. And I just lifted my finger directly above my head like this and touched the tent and dropped my finger and thought, (laughs) nothing happened. (laughs) I knew nothing would happen. I knew that my dad is old and always told me not to do stuff, didn't know what he was talking about, and I went blissfully to sleep until the first drop splatted down upon me. Well, Dad had said repeatedly as we set up our tent before the rain started, don't touch it, it will drip. But my curiosity drove me to test his word. So there in the dark, I was experiencing the inescapable consequences of a wrong choice that I had made. As the drops of water rained down on me faster and faster all night long, I faced the horrible reality. I faced the results of my disobedience, the deserved pain from the negligence and willful disobedience that I had offered in response to his direct command was hard for me to bear. The inescapable reality that most humans will face one moment after they die is that they were not prepared for meeting God. They died in their sins. And all who die in their sins face the inescapableness of eternal punishment. I actually laid there. I think that was probably 2 or 3 in the morning. And it didn't get light until about 5.30. And I laid for three and a half hours just hoping that I would soak up all that water so that my dad wouldn't get wet and wake up and be upset at me. And the next morning, by the way, when he woke up, he says, you're already awake. You're always asleep when I wake up. I says, I'm so glad you're awake. I said, Daddy, I'm all wet. And he touched me, and I mean, my whole sleep bag, it just, it got bigger and bigger all night long. It's a wonder he wasn't wet. But it was over. And we hung my bag out by the fire, and it was kind of a fun thing I've never forgotten. And I don't touch tents anymore. I had a second chance. But you know what? You don't have a second chance. You die in your sins and the drips of hell in the darkness never end. And that's what happens in Luke 16 because we meet another person who awoke to a horrible reality. Unlike me, theirs never ends. Mine did. The persons in Luke chapter 16 and we're going to be reading from 19 onward, is a nameless rich man in a, in a 
person we don't know much about other than he was a sick beggar named Lazarus. The place that this story picks up is in the grave moments after death. The portrait is a foretaste of heaven and hell, of bliss and horror, of paradise and pain, of the righteous and the unrighteous, of comfort and torment. And what the details are is Jesus gives us a glimpse through the door of the grave, looking from this side into what happens one moment after you die. That's what this is. So many lost people around us could die this year, unexpectedly, rapidly, and most of them lost. They would enter at death a place the Bible calls the grave, Hades, hell, the pit, Sheol. It's a place that's been feared since the earliest times of life on this planet. It's a dark place of endless night. It's a dreary place of never hope. And most people who think about death think about what it's going to be like more and more. Death is not a popular topic, but people, the older and sicker they get, they start thinking about it. They don't prepare for it. They start thinking about it and trying to get it out of their mind. There are dozens of verses in the Bible that take us through the door of death and let us tour the afterlife. This is one of the most powerful because this is right from Jesus' mouth. And as I read it, I want you to notice how he clarifies things for us. In fact, let's, let's begin, starting in verse 19. Jesus is telling the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Notice what he says in verse 19 of chapter 16 of Luke. The first two words. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Verse 20. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate. Now hold on for a minute. Look what's missing in this verse. Did you know there's something missing in this verse? You notice he doesn't say, and he told a parable to them. Look what it says. Jesus did not say, learn the parable of the rich man, like we read in Luke 12 previously, and in almost all of his other parables. No, he speaks in a totally different way. He said, there was a certain rich man. Jesus was speaking of a literal event which he as God had knowledge of. Now, now that is a very arresting thought. Note also, he doesn't say that the rich man was particularly bad. He wasn't a notorious sinner. All he was was successful. He was well-fed. He was well-dressed. He was even cautious about strangers. Here's this bum, and he, you know, wouldn't you? If you saw someone covered with sores, would you run over and hug him? I mean, no, we would go, whoa. They might have a communicable illness, you know, covered with sores. And they're poor and sick and dogs are licking them. You know, wouldn't you pull your kids close to you and walk kind of a little bit around them? I mean, that is, I'm not saying it's bad, it's just normal. This guy was was normal. It doesn't, you know, it's interesting, Jesus could have told us that that he was horrible. He doesn't, he just says he's rich and well-fed and well-dressed and cautious and mortal like all the rest of us. It's amazing. His only real problem we're going to find in this story is that he had those common sins that all people have. And he died in them. See, Jesus doesn't say he was a blasphemer, a God-hater, a pervert, someone that was involved in secret, gross immorality. Mm Mm-mm. He just had the common sins that all people have, and he died in them. He died with them on him, his sins. Okay, let's continue reading. Look at verse 22. So it was the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. Doesn't say the rich wicked man, doesn't say the rich horrible man, just the rich, cautious, well-fed, well-dressed, normal man died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades... He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Verse 24. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Now stop again. I want you to think about this. Here Jesus explains a second truth to us. Okay? Before the cross, this is before the cross. It's Luke 12. The cross is later, okay? Before the cross, when our pardon was paid, 
Before that, the righteous dead, like Abraham, Moses, etc., did not go directly to heaven, which is a privilege that we have. The last verse of Hebrews 11 talks about the fact that they without us could not be made perfect. They needed what we get, and that's after the cross, the work of Christ. So there's something wonderful here for us that we have. As blood-bought Christians of the church age, instead of going directly to heaven, they went to this place called paradise. That's what's talked about. The grave, Sheol, Hades, was at that time divided in two. One was a place of comfort, paradise, Abraham's embrace. The other was a place of torment, but both were located physically in the grave or hell as it's called in many places. And by the way, the Bible always implies it's downward and it always implies it's in the earth. In fact, there's an entire chapter of the Bible about that in Ezekiel and it talks about all the dead of all ages that are stacked in the sides of the pit and it says that, that they are going to rise up when Satan is brought. And, and they're, they're, it's going to be a humiliation because the one that was so mighty has also fallen with them. So, I mean, a lot to be learned about studying the grave in the Old Testament. But note also what this, the verse we just read said, that the rich man can see Lazarus and he speaks of a literal torment and of a literal flame. It wasn't psychological. I mean, this guy just hits this place, and he gives us an on-the-spot report. And Christ is a reporter, telling us what he said. And Abraham explains the division of hell that Lazarus can't come to him. Now look down at the account again at verse 27. The rich man cries out, and he says this. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Now stop there again. I want you to see something else. Note that the rich man remembers his life on earth. And he will remember that for eternity. Hmm. That's a sobering thought. Amazing. He remembers his loved ones. He's conscious of their destiny. He begs Abraham to do something. But Abraham simply responds. Look at verse 29. Abraham said to him, They have... Moses and the prophets. They have the scriptures. Let them hear them. Verse 30, and he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He was convinced that they needed to have interdiction in their life, that they needed to have their lives stopped, that they need to stop to repent, to turn away from what they were doing. He says, if if someone... If if Lazarus came back, no. Verse 31, he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rises from the dead. Now I want you to note something in God's word that's extremely revealing. You've heard this story so many times. Have you ever noticed this? Abraham, in this account, is Abraham. Lazarus is Lazarus. Who's the other person? You notice the rich man has no name. That's something to stop and think about for a moment. He has his memories. He has his awareness of his surroundings. He knows the hopelessness of the situation. And the only thing he wants more than a drink of water is to save his five brothers. But he has no name. That's not a mistake. It's not an oversight. Why is that recorded in this passage? Why is there an intentional omission of his name? Probably because he doesn't need a name. No one will ever speak it again. There will be no reprieve, no visitors, no hope, no need for a name. To all intents and purposes, this man is dead, although he'll be eternally aware of it. He faced eternal, conscious, perpetual, lonely torment, being forever dead yet alive. He is inescapably remembering the time when he could have escaped the torment. Now, that's what awaits the mailman that might work around you that doesn't know Christ. That's what 
awaits your next door neighbor. That's what awaits the people you travel up and down the highways with in their cars, that you go up the elevators with, that you walk through the school halls with. That's what awaits the people that are at your family reunion that die in their sins. Those are the ones we say, I'll talk to them when the time's right or when, when we say to them the gospel and they say, I'll think about it maybe tomorrow. But remember what God said in Luke 12. Watch out. This night your soul will be required of you. These are the last days. The rapture is coming. The tribulation is almost upon us. The king is coming. But he's not here yet. And there are plenty of people alive today who won't be here then either. And Jesus left us on this planet alive and conscious for what purpose Jesus said I'm leaving you to go into all the world and to declare the gospel to tell men and women and boys and girls about the danger of dying in their sins and to tell them that there is one who came and in their place bore their sin And that if they will believe in him, that all their sin will go upon him. But that's only half the gospel. That only takes you back to the moral innocence of Adam. Did you realize that? The gospel is much more than just Jesus died on the cross for my sins. That only takes me back to what Adam was before the fall. The other half is that his perfect life is what? Imputed to me. And I can have the right to be the son of God he takes my sin on himself but that's not all he does the miracle is he puts his righteousness on me that's why we're secure it's not how good I can be I can never be good enough even after I was saved I can't be good enough it's God's grace and the imputation of Christ's righteousness well we just looked through the door of the grave Jesus said in John 8 24 you'll die in your sins if you don't believe in me, if you don't believe that I am the only one that can take your sins on myself, if you don't believe that you are lost and undone and helpless and crushed and ruined and desperately unable to do anything about your sin, if you don't allow me to take your sins away and clothe you with my righteousness. But for those who have, we say, God forgave my sins in Jesus' name. And I've been born again in Jesus' name. What's going to happen to you one moment after you die? A while back, I was, I was at an uh, incredible conference with 3,300 Bible-believing, Bible-teaching pastors. And I heard R.C. Sproul, and he concluded his sermon this way. He said, you know what? And he looked all the way across us in the audience. He said, there are men here tonight who have never been justified by the death of Jesus Christ. They just believe good doctrine. They love doctrine, but they don't know the Savior. I thought, if you can say that, Sproul, to 3,300 Bible expositors, ah, what about our churches? Do you know for sure your sins are on Christ? Or do you just know for sure you prayed something? Do you know for sure that Jesus Christ knows you? Or do you just know about him? Is it personal? Is it real? Has it changed you? Has he taken up residence? Have your appetites changed? Has your attitude begun to change? Have your actions begun to change? And when you sin, do you feel utterly miserable until you confess and receive cleansing and forgiveness or do you just kind of comfortably keep all that in the distance and say "Yeah, it's all okay I know you know it's okay I did that I would never rest if my only hope of salvation was I did that and if I never said that I had experienced what he had done a new heart a new spirit the growing awareness that he lives in me and it's no longer I but Christ 
What's going to happen one moment after you die? Do you know for sure that your sins are gone and shall not be remembered? Would you bow with me? Father, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for the sobering story that you gave, O Christ. There was a man, but he's without a name because he's dead. And there's no recourse for him. But we're alive. And you have said to us to flee to you, the Lamb of God, the only hope for taking away our sin. If we know you this morning, may we be very grateful that our sins are on you, O Christ. And for anyone who doesn't know you, may they be very much in dread of what will happen one moment after they die if they dare to die in their sins. Thank you. Help us as we quietly, soberly ponder you, O Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.